typically as a licensee or a user, you you ask for the indemnification uh, from the licensor. The idea being as, as the licensee that you would look to the licensor and say, hey, if someone comes knocking on our, our door and says, that's our software, it's in your system and you're using it, um, you know, pay us, you're liable. Um, that would be something the licensor should, should, should indemnify the licensee. And so it's quite reversed in that context and, and pretty egregious. Welcome to the Contract Teardown Show from Law Insider, where legal experts tear down contracts from some of the most well-known companies and high-profile executives around the world. In this episode, Ryan Finn tears down a software license agreement from Vortimo. This agreement is fairly typical of licensing agreements that get stuck in a large company's pile. And Ryan focuses on how to translate the language into decision makers' business speak. There's balancing risk against business objectives in here, so let's tear it down. Hey everybody, welcome back to the Contract Teardown Show from Law Insider. I'm Mike Whalen. The purpose of the show is exactly what it sounds like. We take contracts, we beat them up with smart friends like my buddy Ryan Finn over here. Ryan, how are you today? Doing well. It's Friday, right? <clears throat> It's Friday somewhere. I feel for my uh, Australian friends who are already into the weekend. I wish I was one of those people. Uh, today, guys, we are going to look at a document as we do. It is this document. Uh, this is a pretty prototypical uh, license agreement for software. Comes from a company called Vortimo, which is a bad guy from Harry Potter the sequel, I'm pretty sure. Uh, and we're going to go through this. As you can see, this one actually comes from Law Insider. So you will see links in here that you can uh, uh, go look at similar language elsewhere. Uh, but we're going to talk through this with my buddy Ryan. Ryan, first, why this document? Why are we looking at this? When are lawyers going to run into this, either as drafting or as counsel to interpret this thing? What's what's why is this representative of the typical document of this type? Yeah, you know, companies more and more you're licensing software as a licensee, so you're uh, some business, uh, someone in the business gets excited about a product's functionality, and they hey, we got to have it, we got to we got to bring it into the fold, and so hey, quickly we need to sign up to take advantage of a price discount. Can you review the terms and, and can we get uh, access ASAP? So that's that's how Push that works. Push all the buttons. Uh, don't get in the way, lawyer. So, uh, but Ryan, why you? Uh, you you're, you're working in-house. Tell me about your background. Uh, if you're running into these kinds of documents, uh, what, what's your experience with this? Yes, yeah, so I I've, uh, am an attorney. I've bounced around some, some operations and legal roles. I'm currently at Boeing in our contract risk management function. Um, and so it's just review terms and conditions, mitigate risk and and do so quickly. So it's a, it's a, it's a high volume uh, supply chain support function. Yeah, it's an, an interesting background to think about these contracts. And we're gonna talk about that a bit. And especially we'll talk about how you translate some of these documents into corporate decision makers speak, because that's ultimately uh, what this contract function is that you're dealing with. But we're gonna go through, uh, you've identified some sections that you wanna talk about. Let me start up at the very beginning, because I think this is an interesting little paragraph. I, I, I don't see this a lot, but in the introduction, Vortimo gives this is what we do. It's sort of an expectation setting paragraph. He's, uh, and it says in here, uh, Vortimo assists you to record, augment, search, recall, scrape, enrich, and export web pages that you have browsed. What do you think about this paragraph? Do you like this intro? This is what we do kind of paragraph. Well, I think, you know, when you're, when you're analyzing contracts, the context of what you're really bringing into the fold as far as what the product does is is just vital. I mean, there's no, you know, risk analysis, a part of, well, what does it apply to from, from a product functionality standpoint? And you don't always see that in that opening paragraph. And to be honest, um, I just thought that was interesting what the product does, but you're always going to be looking to something more and, you know, formalized specifications or documentation to get into the nitty gritty because, you know, the one sentence, here's what we do, uh, take it at that, you know, there's always, there's always stuff behind closed doors and, and in the devil's in the details, right? Of Okay, well, what does that look like from, from, a, from a product architecture standpoint? And so um, I think it's a pretty cool product, but yeah, you, you would never rely on that one sentence to get a whole grasp yeah. of the entire context. Sure. And it's an interesting paragraph to say, I'm going to set expectations right now. It's sort of written for people, uh, not for lawyers, which is interesting. It doesn't have all the heretofores and where and afters. So way to go, Vortimort, Volta, Vorta, Vorta. 
<laughs> really, Harry Potter too. Uh, getting down to section seven on the feedback. So we've talked about this, uh, but we had a long conversation with John Grant about agile software development. And one of the things that we know that software companies are going to do is change, right? They're going to make iterations. And part of that is a feedback loop. <laughs> down in seven, there's a specific section about feedback and how feedback works. Uh, it says you can submit to Vortimo via our contact us page, your suggestions, enhancement requests, recommendations, or general feedback. And we'll see if we can fit it into our development roadmap. And then in parentheses, it says no promises, which I really like. You know, again, this is consistent with agile software development. What do you think about this paragraph as something included in the software agreement? Yes. Yeah, so obviously, you know, it's fun to be able to think that you may contribute to a software's development, particularly if it comes back and, and benefits your, you know, your business case, your, your need. But, you know, this paragraph is is quite broad in that you're granting and you know an entire right of information that you might provide in the form of you know full ownership and and the paragraph goes on from a licensing standpoint so the risk is what happens if an employee or someone you know has an idea for for feedback and in terms of hey the product would be cool if it did it but did this but there's always a risk of including information that leans into the proprietary sort of lane of things and so Although it's nice to think, hey, um, let's contribute to Vortimo's product development, the risk of potentially including your own company's proprietary information and signing up to a paragraph which says, no matter what you say, we basically own it and can use it uh, forever in perpetuity. So uh, the benefit of contributing to their product roadmap probably outweighed by the risk of saying things you might not want to sign away an entire um, right to. So in that case, I, you know, you want to pretty much strike that entirely and say, um, if we... If we if we are so inclined to to you know give suggestions for your roadmap, um, we're not going to include a, a broad right to for you to own everything we say. So that's just a little bit of a risk there. Hey everybody, I'm Mike Whalen. I hope you're enjoying this episode of the Contract Teardown Show. Real quick, I want to ask you to do me slash you really a quick favor. Look down below. You'll see a discount code to join the Law Insider premium subscription. When you do that, you get access to more content like this. You'll see webinars, daily tips on contract drafting, not to mention access to the world's largest database of sample contracts and clauses. It will help you write better contracts faster. If you want to do it right now, there's a code below, so get there. Also, if you're part of a larger team, if you're in-house or in a law firm, just email us. We're at sales at lawinsider.com. We'll make sure you get a deal as well. Come join us in the community. The code is below. Let's get back to the show. Boy, that's interesting. I would have never thought of that. And and so really, you know, you're adding the parentheses, no promises on both sides, which I think is interesting. Uh, jumping down to uh, number nine, third party components, part A. Uh, it talks about uh, the third party software stuff. Uh, it says, um, anybody, uh, they may be third party beneficiaries of this license with the ability to directly enforce the provisions pertaining to their third party software. You need to comply to those additional terms. So you might be signing up for sort of a vague, uh, a vague obligation here. What do you think about this section? Yeah. Modern software is, you know, there's so many third party open source components, um, APIs. I mean, it's, you know, the modern product is constantly evolving and there's a lot of hybrid hybrid approaches to compiling both proprietary software that you make in house or that you are sub licensing to a licensee from, you know, from third party sort of sources. And so what's that in of itself is not a red flag, but oftentimes you'll see a proprietary offer like Vortimo saying, Hey, we're going to, we're going to throw in third party software. We're going to, you know, mix it in. But if there's any issues, um, any problems with the product, any problems with liability, you can go right to them and, and find them and, and negotiate and figure it out with them. It's sort of like a disclaimer to say, hey, we're, you know, we're just not really liable for anything. And so, um, you know, I think the proper stance for a company reviewing that is to say, if we're paying you um, whatever proprietary combinations of software that you mix in, that's kind of on you to to uh, to seek out contribution or liability from them. Um, but we're, we're, we're negotiating between you and me. So, um, the, the idea you can disclaim everything away that you package in just doesn't doesn't really make sense for a licensee. Right. Uh, jumping down to the duration and termination, I, this is probably pretty typical, I would assume, uh, but they've got an automatic renewal of of the subscription, right? Uh, if you want to avoid it in two uh, A two, it says. 
if you want to avoid that renewal, you got to let us know. Notify us in writing at least 30 days prior to the last day of the initial period. If we receive no termination notice, your subscription plan will renew automatically. Uh, I could list off all the subscriptions in my house that I just magically discovered sure. in my bank statement later. Uh, do you think this kind of statement uh, should be included in a document like this? What, what's raising your red flag here? Yeah, and here's an instance where as, as an individual user or licensee, you might not have the ability to negotiate. Um, and, and we often, we all have our auto renewals hit and we wish we canceled our, I won't name a, a subscription for, for fear of uh, <laughs> calling them out is not worthy of a renewal. But I mean, in the case of, you know, companies have a hard time sometimes within their ecosystem managing those auto renewals. Obviously, though, you, know, you, you don't want to be paying a really high bill um, for a license fee if, if you miss that. And I think that 30 day window is just fairly small. So I think it's pretty good practice as as an enterprise to say we just don't sign up for auto renewals. It's the cost of forgetting to, to miss uh, miss that deadline by a day is just too much for as opposed to an individual where it's maybe not quite the same fee. Hmm. And similarly, uh, jumping down to, I think, looking at the architecture of this document, we're down in 3.2b uh, under termination. It says termination for breach without prejudice to any other rights. Vortimo may terminate this license effective immediately upon written notice to you. If you fail to pay any portion of the fees within the agreed period or you breach any other provision of this license, I I'm assuming these big companies are relying on these kinds of softwares, uh, you know, effective immediately termination that might get you in trouble. What do you think about this section? Yeah, as an enterprise, if you're, and again, it, it always depends, right? The nature of, and the importance really of the software to your supply chain or ecosystem. Um, you really want to be careful about a minor breach allowing for a wholesale termination. Uh, and so, you know, cure periods are pretty common. Hey, g g give us a notification you know, let us, let us cure within, you know, 30 days or whatever it might be. And, and even pushing for more than that. But the idea that a, a minimal breach or, you know, missing a single payment can terminate your entire license, that can be pretty disruptive to the enterprise and supply chain or wh whoever is using it. So uh, at a minimum, a, a pretty extensive cure period and at a maximum, you know, limited to a material breach that would, that would justify a wholesale termination is, is good to push for. Yeah. And I, I, I mean, maybe this is a general principle, but it really feels like a lot of this language they might have taken from a consumer based software and then said, let's just apply it to this company. And you're seeing sort of the holes yeah. of how how this situation is totally different, right? Yeah, it, it, vastly different. I mean, you just don't have leverage as an individual in the same way you do as an enterprise. Uh, but I mean, so many license agreements that you run across you don't know where they've come from, what they've been sourced and patched together with, but right. you, know, you see language that clearly is just sort of a, a Frankenstein of the internet of, of license agreements, and and it's not a not a one size fit all, especially if you are an enterprise with with the ability and a lot of protection needed from from a risk standpoint. This is where we insert the informal uh, commercial for LawInsider.com. Look at the uh, discount information below. Under 12, go into warranties. Uh, we've got the all caps section that we need. The software is provided on an as is basis. Consequently, Vortimo makes no and disclaims all warranties and conditions of any kind, whether express, implied, statutory, et cetera, and so on. Uh, again, appropriate for this context? <clears throat> again, as an individual, um, you're a little bit left in, in, the, in the dark with some of your, your warranty remedies. Uh, as an enterprise, you expect a pretty full blown warranty. And what you really need is, you know, first of all, the as is language entirely, entirely removed. But, you know, the, the idea being, however you describe the software from a functionality standpoint, whatever the specs say, it features and functions that it performs. At a minimum, what we get is gonna be what you describe as you're sending over. Uh, and so the, the idea that you can disclaim any and all warranty and give it on an as is basis, particularly if the investment is high, and I, I don't know the, the numbers for this, um, license fee. But you know, the more you're spending, you would not expect it just to hold the bag if, if it shows up and it's just not, not what they said it was. So, right. Big uh, down right. in 13, continuing with the theme here, uh, the liability, this is the limitation of liability, the liability of Vortimo for faulty execution of the software, as well as all damages suffered by the licensee or you, whether direct or indirect, as a result of malfunctioning of such, such software, will be limited to Vortimo rectifying the malfunction within a reasonable time and free of charge. Um, 
as long as they get the notification. Uh, what do you think about this? This is a pretty limited, limited liability. Yeah, liability is always that. Uh, hey, you know, let's get to the liability section. I mean, certainly, it's it's a red, it's a hot button. It's it's the mo- probably the most contested. It's it's not always the case where you know you need an unlimited liability if, if you're a licensee and the supplier needs to play for everything, direct and indirect. I mean, there's some pretty industry standard direct versus indirect damages disclaimers, and it, part of it depends honestly on I think the price that you're paying. Um, you know, you you, know, you hear the one X, ten X cap, all these sort of. If you're paying fifty thousand dollars for a software, the difference between one and one and ten X um, won't be significant. If you're, you know, if you're paying ten million dollars for an enterprise software, so the number, the value of the license fee in and of itself is is a variable. But I think in this case, what you're looking at is just a wholesale liability limitation that just basically says all we have to do in common common is fix is the malfunction itself. Um, not even the damage is potentially caused by the malfunction. Just our software isn't working. We'll fix that. And oh yeah, it wreaked havoc in your, in your network or, you know, as an example, and, and we're not even going to have to, um, be on the hook for damages purely just to fix a malfunction. So it is a really, um, really unacceptable from an enterprise standpoint, liability provision. And so it would need, it would need some beefing up for sure. Right. Well, and and relatedly, the indemnification clause is always uh, hotly contested. Uh, down in 14B, it says that you're going to indemnify Vortimo against any claim for alleged infringement of any intellectual property right or any other right of a third party arising out of the use of the software by you. I'm thinking about the earlier section about your relationship with third parties. Seems like you're taking on, uh, on a lot of risk here. Yeah, so this was an interesting one because... Typically, uh, as a licensee or a user, you you ask for the indemnification uh, from you know from the supplier for the, from the licensor. Um, you know the idea that a third party might see an infringement of their own IP intellectual property, and you know as a licensee, you can be on the hook for your use of that as a form of infringement. It's not as common, but the idea being as, as the licensee that you would look to the licensor and say, Hey, if someone comes knocking on our, our door and says, that's our software, it's in your system and you're using it, um, you know, pay us, you're liable. Um, that would be something the licensor should, should, should indemnify the licensee. And so it's quite reversed in that context and, and pretty egregious, I think, from the standpoint of, uh, I know we need to flip that entirely. And, and that, that would be an area of, of, of grave concern, I think, as, um, as a licensee to want to switch that context. The last thing I wanted to talk about was down in 19, support and maintenance. This is, I mean, I think we all know with these software deals that it's often the support and maintenance stuff. That, that's the business model, right? A lot of these softwares, that's where they're getting money out of these companies. Uh, in A and B, it talks about general support. Go look at the website. This is where our support function will be listed. Uh, and, and it says, or other such website as may be confirmed from time to time. And then in B, it talks about the premium plan software email support as per the details communicated to you on download of the software under the premium plan. So in general, we're sending people off to things that can be periodically updated. This is a huge money section of these contracts. What do you think about just sending people out? Yeah, you hit it on the head. I mean, those the the terms of, of the support and maintenance, particularly if it's being paid for, and it usually is as an enterprise, um, you know, that's not something we want to go to see, oh, by the way, and by the time you get to that link, it's it's been changed to say we we don't a- even have phones to answer you. So those are terms you'd want to, to see, review, and, and have really um, statically applied within the contract and, and not subject to, to unilateral change. And I did find that, you know, the email reference to as email, that was even worse, perhaps. Um, so again, this is an area where as an individual, right, you're, you're not probably going to go to Apple and negotiate or, or any. Um, software provider, their support terms. It is what it is, but as an enterprise, you certainly would you would hope to to review those terms and, and pay for it, um, to review execute as part of the agreement um, and not have a link that can be changed unilaterally. Uh, or if if it can be changed, you know, some sort of a notice or degradation, sort of um, lack of degradation warranty. But that's even it, it's got to be a part of the contract if you're if you're an enterprise licensee. Right. Well, and as we wrap up, I, I always like to sort of take this out from general principles. And I've I've heard some themes in this about how, you know, 
what applies from an individual to a company and, and what your leverage is. And those are important principles. But one of the things I wanted to talk to you about in your function is you're having to translate a lot of this contract language into corporate speak for decision makers that might think differently about these risks you know, about what they're taking on, what the cost benefit analysis, they might think differently about this stuff than a lawyer would. They might quantify risk and say, I want to take this on. So tell me about sort of translating these documents for decision makers. What kind of principles can we pull from a document like this? Yeah, you, you always hear the, um, you know, from the business, hey, can you put that in business speak? I don't, I don't speak legalese. And, um, you know, at the end of the day, business is about you know, making decisions on quantitative matters. I mean, it's lawyers might not be, you know, conversant in net present value or, Hey, do we have a you know, positive internal rate of return? And that's kind of some, you know, corporate finance stuff that isn't always on the table regardless, um, even in the standard business meeting. But the idea being, you know, we need to make decisions from data. Um, and as much as possible, an attorney, you're hoping to turn things from a qualitative risk to a quantitative. Um, and that is a challenge because, you know, probably risk in, in a large part is about probability and, Probability is about statistics, um, and so you're you're trying to get things into a way that business partner can speak and understand. And there is that gap that you sort of have to to move into. Um, you know, everything is relative, and that goes back to the, the beginning of hey, well, what is what does the supplier provide? Um, you know, the relativity of well, what else is available in the marketplace, right? What's our leverage? And so, context um, and risk is all about context, and, and context is all about probabilities. And so, you're trying to understand. What is the probability of a risk event on this provision? Um, and what will be the outcome of that risk event, right? I mean, if there's a 1% chance of a $5 um, negative outcome, you're, you probably don't want to die on that hill. And so you have to kind of get into dollarizing risk and opportunity. Um, and then fundamentally, you have the cost benefit analysis of, do we have other options? Um, if this is the only player in town and in IT, that's often the case, we might want to negotiate for our standard positions, but unfortunately, we don't have another option and we obviously can't state that at the negotiating table, but th that's got to be a factor. So I think for lawyers, th there's always that difficult jump to get into the quantitative space, but they do it already when they say things like, well, it depends, right? You know, well, what does it depend on? And, you know, this court might decide this way, but the analysis can't just be limited to this court typically decides things this way. You got, you got to go all the way as far as you can to a quantitative model, um, which requires tracking contract outcomes. But in the large part, it's just about, well, what is the probability of event occurring times the negative dollar outcome? Um, and how do we sort of weigh leverage as, as, as to other suppliers? So all that is is trying to get more into the language that business understands and less out of, you know, governing law and, and, and jurisdictional matters that lawyers sometimes like to just kind of stay in that qualitative lane. So, yeah. And I know this is a, a thing that you like to nerd out about a lot. Uh, it's it's um, presumably helpful in your function. But obviously, in law school, we don't get a lot of that training about how to think like business people. Uh, do you have any you know thoughts on resources that lawyers might be able to jump to to sort of get a start on this kind of thinking, maybe add some context to, to their advice to be able to say this is what a quantitative risk looks like i mean even that term right to be able to quantitate risk sure. any any tips on resources that they might be able to start with well i won't suggest getting you know going getting your mba or emba but a lot of those concepts um do translate and apply i think you're seeing a general shift in the marketplace overall where lawyers are needing to speak metrics needing to speak return on investment and and quantify risk. It is a difficult transition because the average lawyer is is such a qualitative person. Hey, I don't like numbers. I'm going to go to law school. Um, I have to start thinking about numbers and math again. And it's not to say that a lawyer needs to be conversant in again net present value and 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 really in depth. But there just has to be a um, if, if nothing else, an ingraining in the context of what this deal and provision represents. Um, in, in, in dollar terms as much as possible. And that just comes a little bit from practice, but the marketplace is really opening up to that data-driven, I think, computational law and more and more. So I think it's just about having to kind of seek out those resources and, and start from, from baby steps. But some of it is just, you know, I, you kind of give the example of, if you're at a museum and, and full of fresh water fountains, you're probably not gonna sell $10 bottles of water. Um, if we're at the last truck stop for the next 100 miles in the desert, that's going to sell for $10. And so everything is relative. And so you have to just kind of grasp that cost 
is relative to benefit, that a contract is an exchange of economic value for risk. And and if, if, if all risks are, are shut down, then you gain no benefit. So having to understand risk is a natural part of, of business growth and how do you manage that? So um, you got to facilitate opportunity as a business attorney. Otherwise, you're you're the land of, of no, um, and the legal department sometimes had. That. Yeah, the common uh, complaint from uh, from clients is that my lawyer doesn't understand my business. So definitely some homework to do there. So uh, uh, Ryan, if people want to get in touch with you to follow up about how you're working through these things, what kind of resources you're using to learn how to better speak to business people and and do that translation work, what's the best way to reach out to you? You know, LinkedIn or Twitter, um, growing, growing a little bit more uh, social media um, active. I think that, you know, and, and that goes towards a lot of people and resources that you, you run into if, if you if you follow sort of communities and particularly around being a data driven, you know, attorney with with a conversant enough in business to be able to facilitate. So um, anyways, I, I love LinkedIn and Twitter these days. I think there's so many so many high quality attorneys and, and people in this in this space that are really um, doing some pretty cool stuff. So yeah, that would be probably the best way. Indeed. And we'll include links to that as well as to this particular document. Uh, you just need to go over to lawinsider.com slash resources. You can find the show notes to this episode. Also, if you want to be a guest on the Contract Teardown Show, just email us. We're at community at lawinsider.com. I'd love to hang out with you. Thank you, Ryan, for hanging out with me today. And we will Mike, see you next a plug in too for having a newly newly arrived at Law Insider. I, man, the, the access to, to provisions and contract templates to you know to, for that analysis and comparison is is pretty awesome. So it, I was I was impressed. It, it, there's a lot of use there. It, it's uh, there's my my plug, my unpaid the, plug. The checks in the mail, Ryan. <laughs> thank you for joining us. We'll see you guys on the next contract teardown show. Thank you, Ryan. Thanks. <laughs>